Good morning everyone and welcome to the Myerson Spring 2023 Property Investor Update. Today is Wednesday the 22nd of March and I'm Joanne Perrett, the head of the real estate team here at Myerson. The property market remains quite difficult and slow at the moment uh, with deals on both the sale and purchase side and also in relation to new lettings taking a lot longer than normal to get through to completion. We are starting to see some signs that things are starting to move in terms of pricing and interest rates, which will hopefully stimulate the market. Um, perhaps a bit of sunshine in MIPIM last week will help to get things moving too. The announcement in the budget last week that the lifetime tax-free allowance for pensions has been abolished, and also that the annual tax-free savings allowance has increased from £40,000 to £60,000, that's also likely to stimulate further interest in the market as individuals with SIPs who had maxed out their pension pots, as they were, um, return to the table. The real estate sector faces a number of regulatory pressures at the moment, including most imminently the changes to the MIS regulations, which come into effect in 10 days or so. We've covered these changes extensively in previous webinars, and so we won't be focusing on them directly today, but they are going to have a big effect on the market. It was reported in the Estates Gazette last week uh, that current estimates are that 120 million square feet of commercial real estates across England, which is equivalent to 199 shards, uh, they'll have a failing EPC from next month. Today, though, we're going to focus on leases and how they're going to need to change in the face of the climate change crisis and ESG sentiment generally, um, and the likely further increases in regulation over the coming years. So Sarah Cowan will take us through the issues for landlords um, that they need to consider when granting new leases over the coming years. Sarah McNair will then talk about tenant insolvency and its effect on the landlord. Um, this is something we're advising clients on more and more as the economic climate continues to be very difficult for tenants, particularly in the hospitality and retail sectors. Continued energy cost increases and um, issues with supplies crippling many businesses. Laura Pyle will then look at the Building Safety Act and what landlords need to do to comply with the latest obligations. Property owners must register all higher risk buildings with the Building Safety Regulator between April and October this year, and there will be sanctions if you don't do that. Karen Taylor will then talk about two areas of leases which continue to evolve quickly and can be very contentious for landlords, particularly now due to the changing landscape post COVID, with the increased focus on ESG and the effect of the built environment on the climate. Karen will look firstly at reasonable updating in renewal leases and to what extent a landlord is able to change the terms of a lease to try to better protect themselves in light of changing custom and regulation. Uh, she'll then move on to talk about what is reasonable in terms of service charge costs and some recent case law which looks at this. Um, so firstly, I'd like to hand over to Sarah Cowan to talk to us about green leases. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Joe. Environmental, social and governance, or ESG considerations, have become increasingly important within the real estate industry in recent years, with many property owners and occupiers having developed ESG policies to improve the environmental performance of their properties. As such, many property owners are adopting green leases to promote sustainability and reduce their carbon footprint. For property investors, the trend towards ESG and green leases is highly relevant as it affects the value of and demand for real estate assets. There is a growing preference among commercial tenants for properties that prioritise sustainability and environmental responsibility. Buildings that are energy efficient and have other eco-friendly features are likely to be more attractive to tenants, resulting in higher occupancy rates and potentially higher rental income. The introduction of the EPC regulations has brought into focus the urgent need to improve the energy efficiency of commercial buildings and we can expect to see the government focus on the green agenda with a further tightening up of the minimum energy efficiency standards or MIS regulations in the future. Investors who are proactive in embracing ESG principles and adopting green leases are likely to be better positioned to meet these regulations and avoid any potential risks resulting from non-compliance. So what is a green lease? A green lease is a standard form lease with additional provisions included, which are aimed at managing and improving the environmental performance of a building. Green leases provide an effective framework for both landlords and tenants to work together 
in achieving a common objective of reducing their environmental impact and in complying with future legislative requirements. Green leases benefit both parties. A sustainable building with lower running costs is more marketable for landlords and more cost effective for tenants to occupy. Green leases can range from light green to dark green. Light green lease clauses impose less responsibility on the parties, such as an agreement to discuss how to improve environmental performance. Dark green leases contain more specific clauses, which are legally binding and require a more significant level of commitment on environmental issues, such as requiring the parties to meet predetermined environmental targets. Which clauses might be relevant for a property will depend on the purpose of the lease and the circumstances of each transaction. When drafting a green lease, these circumstances need to be carefully considered. So looking at what clauses might be in a green lease. Green leases will include an obligation on the parties to cooperate with each other to identify appropriate strategies for the improvement of the environmental performance of the property and the building. Improving the environmental performance of a property would include reducing energy consumption, selecting alternative sources of energy with a lower environmental impact, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and water consumption, improving the efficiency of waste recycling, and reducing waste. There will usually be a data sharing clause by which the parties agree to share the environmental performance data that they each have relating to the premises and the building on a regular basis. There will often be an obligation on the landlord to provide a building management group or other forum to review the environmental performance of the building, improve data sharing, and to agree targets and strategies to improve environmental performance. In return, the tenant agrees to use reasonable endeavours to ensure that a nominated person attends the forum meetings on its behalf. The landlord may reserve a right to install equipment to measure the supply of energy and utilities supplied to the premises. Alternatively, the tenant may have a right to require the landlord to install a meter at the premises at the cost of the tenant, or a right to install its own meter. Green leases will contain a restriction on the tenant carrying out alterations to the premises, which might adversely affect any EPC rating of the premises or the building. You might also see a similar covenant by the landlord in respect of alterations to the retained parts of the building. In terms of reinstatement of tenant alterations, landlords should consider whether blanket reinstatement obligations are appropriate. Where a tenant has carried out alterations which improve the environmental performance of the premises or the building, the landlord may prefer for this to be left at the premises on expiry of the term. Landlords should consider reserving additional rights to enter the premises to carry out works to improve the energy efficiency of the premises and or the building so that it can ensure compliance with MIS obligations. Landlords will be keen to ensure that they can pass the costs incurred in, in improving environmental performance down to the tenants via the service charge. A green lease should extend the definition of services and service costs to include measures, facilities or services as the landlord considers appropriate to improve environmental performance and include costs related to the gathering and processing of environmental performance data. We've seen EPC clauses in leases for quite a few years now. The tenant covenants to comply with any statutory duty to produce a new EPC for the premises or the building arising as a result of works it carries out and provide a copy to the landlord. The tenant agrees to cooperate to allow the landlord to obtain an EPC for the premises or the building and to allow the energy assessor access to the premises. All LEC commercial property will be subject to minimum energy efficiency standard or MIS obligations from April this year. From the 1st of April, landlords will be in breach of MIS duties if they continue to let a commercial property that has an EPC rating below E, unless they have made all possible cost effective energy efficiency improvements prescribed by the MIS regulations or where one of the exemptions applies. We are often asked whether a landlord can carry out works to improve the EPC rating of a property during the term of a lease, and whether the landlord can recover the cost of those works from a tenant. The answer to these questions will depend on the bargaining strength of the parties in the case of a new letting, or on an analysis of lease terms in an existing letting. The key lease provisions to negotiate or consider are statutory compliance, rights reserved in favour of the landlord, service charge, and consent to works. It is important to look beyond an E rating 
due to the government's aim for all non-domestic rented buildings to meet an EPC level B by 2030. It is crucial that landlords consider green lease clauses now to prepare them for further changes to MEES duties in the future. It is likely that the trend towards ESG and green leases will continue to gain momentum. With more widespread commitment to ESG and higher energy costs, it is in the interest of property owners and occupiers to reduce the carbon footprint of their buildings. According to research by Savills Investment Management, 73% of institutional investors expect green lease clauses to be universally incorporated into leases by 2029. Investors who prioritise ESG principles and embrace green leases are likely to see greater demand for their properties, reduced regulatory risks and improved financial performance. I'm now going to pass you over to Sarah, who is going to be talking about tenant insolvency and its effects on landlords. Thanks, Sarah. It's fair to say that we are going through unprecedented times at the moment, and we have seen over the past three years a direct impact on the economic climate resulting from the COVID pandemic, Brexit, the war in Ukraine, and the subsequent energy and cost of living crisis. The political turbulence we have seen over the past year has also had a devastating effect on the market, as well as the recent hike in interest rates. Because of all this, there has been a spate of tenants becoming insolvent, and landlords have increasingly been facing the question of what happens when their tenant becomes insolvent, and what rights do they have as landlord. Under usual circumstances, where a tenant fails to pay the rent due under a lease, a landlord may exercise commercial rent arrears recovery, also known as CRA, for the rent against certain goods of the tenant at the premises, sue for the rent by court action, or forfeit the lease either by court action or by peaceable re-entry under an express forfeiture provision in the lease. If, however, a tenant fails to pay the rent because it is, or may shortly become, insolvent, the landlord's freedom to exercise CRA, sue or forfeit may, may be circumscribed by the Insolvency Act 1986. So let's take a look first at what insolvency is. There are five main regimes for corporate insolvency under the Insolvency Act. Firstly, a Part A1 moratorium, which is an insolvency process that allows eligible companies a short breathing space from enforcement action by certain types of creditors while they organise their affairs to make their rescue viable. During the moratorium, the company will receive a payment holiday in relation to various debts. Secondly, a company voluntary arrangement, also known as a CVA, which is an arrangement between a company and some or all of its creditors that settles the debts of the company to those creditors. The company continues to exist and its property remains vested in it. Thirdly, administration, which is a process that provides a framework for the rescue of an insolvent company. Administration can be initiated by an application to the court for administration order or out of court by giving a notice of intention to appoint an administrator to certain creditors. Fourthly, receivership, which may refer either to administrative receivership or to receivership under the Law of Property Act 1925, also known as LPA receivership. An administrative receiver may be appointed by a lender in relation to the whole or substantially the whole of a company's assets. Alternatively, an LPA receiver can be appointed in respect of fixed charges by the lender, but in either case, the role of an administrative receiver or an LPA receiver is to realise the security of the lender in order to repay the debt. Finally, there is winding up, also known as liquidation. This can be voluntary or compulsory and allows for the realisation of a company's assets, the settlement of its liabilities and its subsequent dissolution. In circumstances where the tenant is an individual, the two insolvency regimes are individual voluntary arrangements, also known as IVAs, the purpose of which is to allow a settlement between the insolvent and its creditors on agreed terms and, as a result, avoid the bankruptcy of the individual. Failing that, bankruptcy proceedings can begin, either with the presentation of a petition for a bankruptcy order by a creditor or a, a debtor's online application to an adjudicator. When a bankruptcy order is made, the individual is made bankrupt and the bankruptcy begins from the date of the order. There are a number of restrictions on a landlord where the tenant is insolvent. For example, if the tenant has obtained a Part A1 moratorium, which is still in effect, the landlord needs the leave of the court to take any enforcement action. Similarly, 
If an application for an administration order has been made, or an administrator has been appointed, the leave of the court or the consent of the administrator will be needed before the landlord can take enforcement action. Where the tenant is an individual, if a bankruptcy petition is, pretend, is pending, court action can be stayed, and once a bankruptcy order has been made, a landlord has no remedies against the bankrupt. A landlord might, therefore, find themselves facing a range of challenges when considering whether to take enforcement action against an insolvent tenant, and may wish to explore other options. Whether the tenant is a corporate tenant or an individual, these can include recovering rent from a former tenant or guarantor, recovering rent from an undertenant, and drawing on rent deposits. Whether or not the landlord can draw on a rent deposit will depend on which insolvency regime applies and whether the deposit is charged to the landlord or held by the landlord as trustee on behalf of the tenant. Where the deposit is charged to the landlord, in relation to CVAs, as a secured creditor the landlord will be able to draw down on the deposit unless the landlord specifically agrees that it cannot by the terms of the CVA. But with an administration, unless the landlord holds the deposit monies as part of its general funds, a landlord will generally need either the administrator's consent or court permission before drawing down on the deposit. With liquidation, there is no prohibition on the secured creditor from exercising its security. Therefore, a landlord is free to draw down on the deposit. Where the deposit is held by the landlord as trustee on behalf of the tenant, the position is less clear, but it is generally thought that a landlord can make deductions from the deposit, despite the tenant's insolvency. A well-timed drawdown on a rent deposit can make the difference in recovering thousands of pounds worth of arrears, but landlords should seek advice on whether it is a good idea to do so as soon as they learn that the tenant may be entering into an insolvency process. Often, when a tenant is insolvent, the tenant's liquidators or administrators will allow a purchaser of the business into immediate occupation of the premises without the landlord's consent. However, the purchaser of an insolvent company cannot simply prevent it, present itself to the landlord as the new tenant, and most leases require a tenant wishing to assign its interest to obtain the consent of the landlord. Landlords of insolvent tenants should not automatically agree to take on the business purchaser as tenant, particularly where there are doubts about the future financial viability of the purchaser, or the landlord has a better option from another interested tenant. So what steps should a landlord take in these circumstances? The sale of an insolvent business by administrators will often include its business premises. The need for the landlord's consent to a lease assignment usually leads to the administrators granting a license to the purchaser to occupy the premises. This action is usually in breach of the lease and even if, even if a landlord ultimately consents to an assignment to the purchaser, they are advised to make it clear to the tenant's representatives that they have not consented to the occupation by the purchaser and that they reserve the right to take action to remove them from the premises. On the basis that the landlord has reserved its position and received rent from the commencement of the administration or liquidation, it will usually then be willing to allow the authorised occupier a short period of time in the premises while it carries out investigations and considered whether, consider, considers whether to consent to an assignment. The landlord will usually rank as an unsecured creditor in relation to any unpaid rent that fell due before the commencement of the formal insolvency and often makes no recovery or a limited recovery. However, if the premises are being used for the purposes of the administration or liquidation, a landlord is entitled to recover rent calculated from the date of commencement of the formal insolvency as an expense of the administration or liquidation, and usually recovers rent for that period in full. The licence will normally require the purchaser to pay a licence fee equivalent to the rent to the administrator for onward transmission to the landlord. However, it is not entirely clear whether this includes other payments which are reserved as additional rent, such as insurance rent and service charges. If the lease reserves a turnover rent, this will of course be a particular issue for the landlord, as payment is tied to the turnover of the tenant generated from the premises, and the tenant will not be trading from the premises. In any case, landlords are advised to make it clear when accepting such payments, especially if the purchaser proposes to pay directly, that the insolvent company will remain as the tenant until any assignment and that any payment is accepted as having been made as agent on behalf of the tenant. Ultimately, the landlord must decide whether to consent to any assignment proposed. In the current climate, even if they have continued doubts about the purchaser's ability to pay the rent for the remainder of the lease term,
retail landlords in particular may still be better off consenting to the assignment to maintain a short-term income rather than risking an extended period with a vacant unit during which responsibility for business rates could revert to the landlord. Sometimes the purchaser may declare that rather than seeking an assignment, they will only remain in the premises in the medium term if a new lease can be negotiated on more favourable terms to the tenant. So this may be an added decision for the landlord to make. If consent is not given, the administrators or liquidators have the option of applying to court for a declaration that consent has been unreasonably withheld or simply proceeding with the assignment on the basis that consent has been unreasonably withheld. However, they rarely pursue these options on practice um, and are more likely to terminate the license. If the purchaser failed to vacate, the landlord would have good grounds to both obtain any court permission necessary under insolvency legislation and succeed in any action to remove them from the premises. On re realising that an assignment will not proceed, a liquidator will usually disclaim the lease, ending the insolvent tenant's interest in the lease. An administrator, on the other hand, has no power to disclaim a lease, so will usually try to agree a surrender of the lease or encourage the landlord to forfeit the lease. Landlords may wish to wait until a new tenant is lined up before surrendering or forfeiting the lease in order to avoid any potential liability for business rates. Thanks, Sarah. Good morning. I'm a member of the property litigation team, and I'm going to focus on recent developments in the commercial landlord and tenant sector with what you'll see as a common theme of reasonableness. I'm first going to look at renewal leases under the Landlord and Tenant Act 1954, and in particular whether recent market changes have fed through to the courts when considering what might be reasonable updating of a business tenancy. I'll move on to service charges and the ability of a tenant to challenge the reasonableness of those charges, with particular focus on the recent case involving Black's Outdoor Retail Limited. So, kicking off with the Landlord and Tenant Act 1954. By way of a recap, this gives tenants a statutory right to a new tenancy in the same terms as its, exist, as its existing lease, save for reasonable updating. If parties can't agree the terms, they can ask a judge to determine them. The courts have jurisdiction over the premises, the length of term, and other terms such as break rights and rent reviews. The question is, what is the interplay between market terms and 1954 Act considerations? So, looking at those terms in a little bit more detail, when making an order on the premises to be demised, Section 32.2 of the Act gives the landlord the right to require the tenant to take a new lease of the entire premises demised by the original lease, even if the tenant no longer occupies that part of its premises for its business. The landlord must, however, invoke this provision in its claim form or acknowledgement of service. If it doesn't, the tenant will only be entitled to a lease of the holding, being the part that it's occupying for its business. In the current climate, we're looking at many tenants um, seeking to reduce their spaces to take into account changing demands in terms of online retail and flexible working. Subletting is a way for tenants to address those market pressures. However, tenants should be aware of the landlord's right to require them to take a lease of the whole. Moving on to the length of the lease term. The court can grant a maximum of 15 years, although in the current market this is unlikely, as tenants are looking for lease terms allowing for more flexibility. In deciding the length of the lease term, the court will take into account the length of the current lease, the effect on the value of the landlord's reversion, the balance of hardship between the landlord and tenant, and the landlord's future proposals to occupy or redevelop. Next up is the rent under the new lease. Since the pandemic, many tenants have been looking to agree turnover rents, which allow the parties to share risk, albeit reducing certainty for landlords. So, how have the courts dealt with requests for turnover rents? Well, under Section 34 of the Act, the court is required to base the new rent on the rent which the property might reasonably be expected to be let in the open market by a willing landlord on the same terms as the tenancy and, importantly, disregarding the tenant's occupation, goodwill and improvements. The requirement to disregard goodwill will, does not sit well with turnover rents. In the recent case involving JD Sports Fashion PLC, the court held that whilst it had discretion to order a turnover rent, in that instance, the request for a turnover rent was declined 
the court's reasoning being that factoring in a tenant's turnover into a rent calculation is having regard to the tenant's business and goodwill built up during the term of the existing lease, and that a turnover rent will penalise a tenant for that goodwill. It's therefore likely that the court will only order turnover rents where the turnover depends on the location, layout and size of the property rather than the tenant's business. It's thought that in some senses this is a really outdated approach, particularly for tenants where goodwill is now built up in advertising and online presence rather than the premises which they occupy. Last but not least, how do the courts look at other terms which the parties may wish to include or update in the lease? Lease negotiations following the pandemic have seen parties sharing risk and flexibility rather than maintaining predictable income streams for landlords. Together with the drive for sustainability, turnover rents, pandemic clauses and green lease provisions are now frequently being negotiated in new leases. However, in a 1954 at lease renewal, the renewal lease is based on the terms of the existing lease. And if one party wants to depart from those terms, it's for that party to justify that departure. The case of O'May made it clear that any changes must be fair and reasonable and should take into account the comparatively weak negotiating position of a sitting tenant. It also says that a change in the, in the rent by way of compensation does not justify the change once it, the, the party is seeking to make to the lease. Not one party should not be made an involuntary insurer of risk. So how has O'May been considered in recent case law concerning pandemic clauses, service charges and green lease provisions? In terms of pandemic rent suspension clauses, the key cases involve WH Smith and Poundland. In the WH Smith case, WH Smith was a tenant in Westfield Shopping Centre and the unit contained a post office which remained open throughout lockdown as an essential retailer. On account of that post office being open, WH Smith was also able to sell other non-essential items, but sales were over 90% down. The parties agreed that the new lease should contain a pandemic rent suspension clause, but the court was asked to determine the appropriate trigger of the clause. Would that be the closure of the store or the closure of non-essential retail in the shopping centre? The court found that the trigger should be the closure of non-essential retailers. It also agreed with the tenant that the market had priced a pandemic clause in. So, all good for tenants, or so, so we thought. Spare a thought for Poundland, who, are also request, who also requested the inclusion of a pandemic clause. Poundland's request was rejected by the court, who found that this would have been a realignment of previously allocated risks forcing the landlord to accept a risk not imposed on it by the original lease. This was not fair and reasonable on the landlord and therefore was not in line with O'May. The court's decisions on this topic are clearly inconsistent. The different outcomes are likely to be due to the fact that the parties had agreed the inclusion of the pandemic clause in WH Smith. Poundland considered O'May in more detail and the decision sits with the O'May principles. Pandemic clauses are usually one-sided, with the tenant receiving the benefit of the clause with no risk and the landlord carrying all of the risk. There's also the potential for a trigger event to result in a reduction in rent, even where that event has no detrimental impact on the tenant's business. Therefore, based on current case law, it's more likely that Poundland will be followed and that tenants' requests for pandemic clauses to be added to renewal leases will be rejected. Turning now to attempts to depart from the existing lease in relation to service charge provisions. The WH Smith case is a goldmine in lease renewals as it looked at this issue as well as pandemic rents. The landlord sought to include a term to allow the recovery of items relating to environmental performance through service charge, arguing that this effect reflected changes in legislation since the original lease and provided greater clarity than the existing sweeper provisions. WH Smith had a great day in court as the judge found that the amendments did not achieve greater clarity and the expenditure had a capital feel which was not fair and reasonable as required by OMA. Landlords should therefore be aware that updating lease provisions on the basis of updates to a precedent lease 
will not automatically constitute reasonable modernisation. Finally, and related to service charges, I'm going to look at how green lease provisions are specifically considered in lease renewals. Sarah has outlined the prevalence of green lease provisions on account of the NIES regulations. However, many protected tenancies coming up for renewal may not contain them. Landlords will want a lease to give them protection from breaches of the regulations by providing me mechanisms for necessary works and prohibiting the tenant from doing anything to put them in breach. In theory, the lease renewal process provides an opportunity for lease modernisation, and this is exactly what the landlord asked for in the case of Clipper Logistics PLC and Scottish Equitable PLC. The landlord requested a prohibition on any tenant works which resulted in a substandard EPC rating, but the court found that the existing lease contained sufficient controls on alterations and the landlord's request was rejected. The court also rejected the landlord's request for an indemnity for the cost of a new EPC where the tenant undertook alterations, finding that this placed a significant burden on the tenant. However, the court did find that the new lease should include an obligation on the tenant to maintain the current EPC rating and, where that rating was not maintained, carry out remedial works to restore it. In this case, the court appeared keen to ensure that duties imposed on landlords by statute were not unfairly imposed on tenants, but the decision was unsatisfactory for a number of reasons. It left both parties unhappy, with neither party's needs being met. From a landlord's perspective, it did not provide adequate protection during the lease term, leaving environmental performance as part of the terminal dilapidations liability. From the tenant's perspective, it imposed a potentially onerous obligation on it to improve the premises at the end of the lease, for which it would receive no benefit. It sought that the court failed to appreciate the full impact of the regulations on the landlord and also missed an opportunity to highlight the importance of, en of environmental sustainability by relying on standard prohibitions on alterations rather than imposing bespoke green clauses. Green lease provisions were also considered in Poundland and Topland, where the tenant sought a provision requiring the landlord to meet the costs of any works requ required to meet the energy efficiency standards. In this instance, the court accepted the provision, rejecting the landlord's argument that the tenant com covenant to comply with statutory obligations covered the position. So, what are the takeaway points from this case law? One of the key points to remember is that O oh, may is narrow. Don't assume that the court will order a renewal lease which complies with current leasing policies. It would be wise to ask your solicitor to review the existing lease at head to term stage and identify any unfavourable terms and prioritise those which are important to you. Then update the head to terms to include the required updates that are unlikely to be allowed under O may although you may need to concede other items in this approach. You could also consider specifically setting out the green clauses in the Section 25 notice or Section 26 request, rather than simply referring to other terms being subject to reasonable modernisation. Essentially, parties should try and agree as many terms as possible before a court application is made, as the court may determine terms which are not reasonable. Finally, unless you've agreed otherwise, Use the existing lease as a starting point for, new, for the new lease. This leads to quicker transactions and lower costs. So that's a run through on reasonable updating for renewal leases. Later, I'll be looking at reasonableness in service charges. I'm now going to pass over to Laura, who will be talking about the Building Safety Act. So good morning and thank you for all joining us today. So this morning I'm going to talk to you about the Building Safety Act and in particular the impact it has on the landlord and tenant relationship. The Building Safety Act was introduced to Parliament in 2021 and received royal assent on the 28th of April 2022. Not all the Act came into force on that date, with most provisions coming into force two to 18 months thereafter. The Act was created to address various building safety issues that came to light as a result of the Grenfell Tower fire in July 2017. The Act has brought about a number of reforms to the law and regulation of building safety. The main reforms and issues addressed by the Act are 
the introduction of a building safety regulator, a new regulatory regime that applies to the planning, construction and occupation of higher risk buildings, changes to the law relating to the liability of developers and construction manufacturers for building safety defects, which does include historic defects, protection for leaseholders in relation to the cost of remediating building safety defects, and the establishment of a new Homes Ombudsman Scheme and a Developer's Code of Practice. The Building Safety Regulator will be part of the Health and Safety Executive. They state that their three main functions will be to firstly oversee the safety and standards of all buildings, secondly help and encourage the built environment industry and building control professionals to improve their competence, and thirdly lead the implementation of the new regulatory framework for high-rise buildings. The Act itself is lengthy and substantial, so today I'm going to give a brief overview of some of the key points that relate to landlord and tenants and their duties and liabilities in relation to building safety matters. So the Act inserts into the Landlord and Tenant Act 1985 terms about safety-related duties and the recovery of safety-related costs for leases of premises in a higher risk building. That's a building that's at least 18 metres in height or has at least seven storeys and contains at least two residential units. Landlords will have to appoint one or more accountable persons for high risk buildings once they're occupied. They have an ongoing duty to ensure the fire and structural safety of the building. The covenants are implied that where the landlord is an accountable person that they will comply with their building safety duties. Now these duties will include registering a higher risk building, assessing building safety risks, taking reasonable steps to prevent and manage building safety risks and undertake remediation works, prepare a case safety report that contains the risk assessments and details of any steps taken to manage the risk, to engage with residents on fire safety issues, now it's recently been announced that the registration process will open in April 2023 and must be completed by October 2023. It is important that registration of the higher risk building takes place as there are penalties for failure to do so. The Act also implies duties on tenants to allow landlords to enter for building safety purposes and to comply with their duties, which include not acting in a way that creates a significant building safety risk, not interfering with safety equipment, complying with requests of the accountable person in relation to them assessing risks in the building, and an obligation to mitigate the risk of serious harm. Now, where a lease is for more than seven years and the tenant is liable to pay a service charge, the lease will take effect as if the service charge provisions included the taking of building safety measures by the relevant person. This means the landlord will be able to recover, subject to other limitations in the Act, the cost of building safety measures through the service charge. This will include the cost of applying for registration of the high risk building, preparing and advising a safety case report, for example. Now, if the lease provides for different methods of apportioning the service charge, then the costs for building safety are to be apportioned in the same way as the cost of insuring. A landlord cannot charge for excluded costs by way of service charge. Excluded costs include any penalties imposed by the regulator, costs of enforcement action, costs incurred as a result of negligence, breach of contract or other unlawful act by the relevant person. It should also be noted that any written demand for rent must contain build building safety information. This means the names and email addresses of the accountable person and any special measures manager, the postal address for service on the accountable person, a postal address for the building safety regulator, and any other information prescribed by regulations. And failure to provide this means that any service charge or administration charge is not due until the landlord gives the information. Now, the Act stops landlords from automatically claiming the costs of remediation works from leaseholders. Landlords are required to take reasonable steps to recover it from elsewhere, for example via grants, insurance or claims against developers. In terms of recovering the cost of remedial work through the service charge, in England, if a leaseholder has a qualifying lease in a relevant building and the defect identified in the building is a relevant defect, 
Restrictions will apply on what costs can be recovered under the service charge for remedial works. A qualifying lease is a long lease, which is more than 21 years in length, of a single dwelling in a building of more than 11 metres or at least five storeys, and the leaseholder is responsible for paying a service charge. The lease must have been granted before the 14th of February 2022, and on that date, the dwelling must have been the leaseholder's main home, and they did not own more than three homes in the UK. A relevant building must contain at least two dwellings and cannot be a leaseholder-owned building. The Act provides for situations where no service charge is payable by the tenant for remediation works. These include where the landlord was responsible for the defect or was associated with a responsible party, this is known as the developer test, or where the landlord meets the contribution condition, and this is where the landlord's group's net worth of the number of buildings over 11 metres with fire safety defects in the landlord group times by £2 million. Where the qualifying lease value is below the prescribed level, which is £325,000 in London and £175,000 elsewhere, they also can't do it for cladding remediation or for legal and professional costs as a result of the defect. Where a landlord does not meet the developer test but meets the contribution condition, the landlord has an obligation to pay for all remediation costs. But where the landlord does not have a net worth of at least £2 million per relevant building, they'll be able to recoup a capped contribution to help pay for the required works. If the landlord can recover costs from the tenant, where remediation works are required to take place, the Act provides for leaseholder or landlord certificates to be provided. The certificates are required to see whether the leaseholder has a qualifying lease and to ascertain their contribution to the works and whether the landlord is responsible for the defects or meets the contribution condition. In England, a landlord must provide a landlord certificate to the tenant if they are required to contribute towards the costs of remedial works by payment of a service charge. And the certificate must be provided when they make a demand to a leaseholder for a remediation service charge, within four weeks of receiving notification that the leasehold interest is to be sold, within four weeks of becoming aware of a relevant defect not covered by a previous certificate, within four weeks of being requested to do so by the leaseholder. The landlord certificate has to be in a prescribed form, confirm whether the landlord has met the contribution condition, confirm whether they were responsible for the defect or associated with the person responsible, must provide information about the landlord and any group structure, must be accompanied by a set of accounts for the landlord and any group company, it must be accompanied by documents or receipts that show when the building was constructed or converted and the works carried out, and must be accompanied by evidence that the person who undertook the work was not the relevant landlord and confirmation of the person who did commission or undertake the works and be accompanied by details of relevant defects and remediation works carried out and the cost of those works. These are onerous obligations and if the landlord doesn't provide a certificate with all the information required then no service charge will be payable for the cost the landlord seeking to recover. Furthermore, a leaseholder can make an application to the first tier tribunal where they believe a landlord has made a false claim in a landlord's certificate. Now, in terms of historical defects, non-qualifying leaseholders are only protected from the costs of historical safety remediation if the landlord satisfies the developer test. Where the landlord does not satisfy that test, the leaseholder will be liable for remediation costs in accordance with the terms of the lease. If the landlord does not remedy the defect when they are liable, the Act does contain some protection for the leaseholders. The Act provides that the first tier tribunal can make two types of orders, remediation orders and remediation contribution orders. Remediation orders are orders that landlords, who have repairing or maintenance obligations, remediate specific defects within a specific time. Orders can also be made against another party to the lease that has repairing obligations, so that will include management companies, for example. To obtain a remediation order, an application needs to be made by an interested person. Interested persons include the Secretary of State, Building Safety Regulator, Local Authority, Fire and Rescue Authority, and any person with a legal or equitable interest in the building.
and an application must identify the building, the defects and the person they consider to be responsible. A remediation contribution order requires a specific company or partnership to make payments towards the costs of rectifying the defects. These orders can be made if the first tier tribunal believes it's just and equitable to do so. The Act also provides for a situation where a landlord who is liable to contribute to remediation costs is insolvent. The Act states that an insolvency practitioner can apply for an order requiring an associate of the insolvent landlord to contribute to the remediation costs. So in summary, there are a number of changes that are being introduced by the Act. This has been a brief overview of some of those changes, and it's important that landlords and tenants understand what their responsibilities are under the Act and take what steps they need to. I'm now going to pass you over to Karen. Thanks, Laura. I'm now going to talk about reasonableness in the context of commercial service charges. Service charges for residential property are subject to extensive legislation, but currently there's no statutory framework governing service charges under commercial leases, meaning that the drafting of these provisions is dependent on the negotiating position of the parties. The lack of legislative guidance makes service charges ripe for disputes between the parties, the latest dispute being that involving Black's outdoor retail. I will first run through the basic mechanics of commercial service charge provisions before looking at this recent case in more detail. So, how do commercial service charges work? There are four main elements of a service charge clause. Firstly, there'll be the definition of the services to be provided. The second element is the tenant's obligation to contribute to the services and how service charge will be apportioned and paid. Thirdly, there'll be a landlord's obligation to provide services. This may be a full covenant or limited to reasonable or best endeavours, which may include an obligation on the landlord to act reasonably and economically. This is particularly relevant in the current climate with the price of energy on the rise. Cutting energy costs allows tenants to stay in business and landlords to meet their obligations under the lease whilst remaining profitable. Tenants paying for energy through the service charge in relation to common parts will be at the mercy of the landlord's utility supply negotiations and will want to ensure that landlords obtain the best deals possible and pass on any saving. Landlords may seek to cut energy costs by reducing services, but will need to ensure that such reductions do not put them in breach of their obligations to provide the services. Lastly, service charge provisions will include a clause dealing with the mechanics of the service charge, including the timetable, preparation and certification of the accounts by a surveyor, dates for payment and provisions in the case of a dispute. Often this provision will state that the service charge certificate is conclusive or final or binding on the tenant and may incorporate an exclusion from manifest error. The Black's case essentially deals with the second and fourth elements, the tenant's obligation to contribute to services and the mechanics of the service charge, charge clause. So what was in dispute? Black's lease contained three relatively standard provisions. Firstly, that the rent and additional rent, such as service charge, be paid without deduction or set off. Secondly, that the landlord's certificate of the amount it had spent on services was to be conclusive, absent of mathematical or manifest error or fraud. And thirdly, that the tenant was allowed a limited period in each year to review the landlord's accounts for any such errors. Black's service charge bill for the year in question was nearly eight times that of the previous year. Black's refused to pay and the landlord applied for summary judgment. The application for summary judgment was refused. The judge found that there was an arguable case that the service charge was not payable and that a professionally advised tenant would not accept a provision which allowed the landlord to act as judge and jury on service charge. There were then various appeals. The landlord first appealed to the High Court and was unsuccessful, the High Court finding in favour of the tenant. The landlord appealed to the Court of Appeal, which found in its favour. The judge said that the lease provisions were intended to limit the tenant's ability to dispute the sums demanded, as the landlord required a reliable income stream to comply with its obligations under the lease. The tenant appealed to the Supreme Court, which found a compromise. 
The court found that the service charge certificate was conclusive and had to be paid by the due date by the tenant. However, the provision allowing the tenant to review the accounts together with a dispute resolution clause on the ex extent of the demise meant that having paid the certified sum, the tenant would be entitled to challenge any sums it disagreed with. This approach has been termed the pay now, argue later interpretation. So what are the takeaway points from this decision? The Supreme Court's decision is viewed as a tenant friendly decision on a traditionally worded service charge provision, albeit that tenants are required to pay service charge demands rather than holding back payment on account of a challenge. Therefore, landlords should be prepared for greater pushback from tenants relying on this decision and should ensure that there's no basis for challenging accounts and the charges. This can be achieved by careful drafting, release provisions, and also by ensuring that an appropriately qualified professional prepares the accounts. So that brings me to the end of my whistle stop roundup of reasonableness in the context of landlord and tenant law. If you're coming across these issues in practice and would like to chat through, please do feel free to give me a call. I'll now pass you back to Joe for the final section of this webinar. Thanks, Karen. Some very interesting points there. If you do have any questions or you'd like to discuss an issue you might have in relation to any of the areas we've covered today or any other issues, then please do get in touch with the team. Our contact details will be on the slide at the end of the webinar. So finally today, I would just like to show you a brief overview of our new property portal. The portal will be going live very shortly and it's something we are really excited about. Uh, so it's going to be a fantastic resource for our property investor clients. The first thing to say is that it's completely free to sign up and access the portal. The first major benefit is that there will be a secure area where we can store all of your deeds and documents for you. So this will really help you with being able to access any documents you might need to refer to regularly. So your occupational lease documentation will be in there um, for each property that you hold, but we can also upload things like insurance and service charge information, anything that would help you to keep track of your portfolio. In addition to this service, the portal will also have lots of really useful content, including guides to various areas of law affecting investors, draft documents you can take away and use, uh, flowcharts for you to use when you have an issue you want to think through, and lots of other relevant news and blogs and videos and things like that, all in one convenient place. Please do sign up, even if you don't want to, or you won't need to use the documentation part of the portal. So if you're a surveyor or an agent or something like that, for example, um, the other information in there will still be really useful. Most of it is only available to subscribers and it won't be anywhere else on our website. You'll also get first dibs on signing up to our webinars and our in-person events. So it's definitely worth getting registered. We'll let you all know as soon as the portal is live and you'll be able to sign up via our website. If you have any questions about it, about it in the meantime, or you'd like to speak to us about getting your documentation loaded onto the system, ready for the launch of the portal, please do drop me a line or give me a call. So that's all we've got time for this morning. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. As I mentioned earlier, if you have any questions at all, or you want to run something past us, please do just give us a call. This webinar will be emailed to those who've signed up, and it will also be posted on our YouTube channel if you'd like to catch up and watch it again. Thanks again for joining us and have a good day.